Adult Swim headquarters at William Street. I'm Matt Harrigan with the Adult Swim podcast. Today, author, Adult Swim programmer, Mark McRae. Let's see what he's got to say. Here we go. What's your title, Mark? My title is Senior Manager of Programming Operations. Senior Manager of Programming Operations. What does that mean? That means that I am the guy that oversees all the promo and packaging strategy for Adult Swim linear as well as nonlinear, making sure the schedule stays on time and working closely with on-air and programming uh, to implement whatever uh, programming um, and promo scheduling strategy is needed for Adult Swim. And you have three cats. Two cats. Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. It's okay. My research is bad. Uh-huh. What happened? Um, what happened to the third cat? Yeah. Uh, the third cat ran away. Yeah. Ran away. Yeah. Well, I have a couple of theories. Either she ran away or, or one of my neighbors took her. Took her? Yeah. Really? Yeah, because... My cat, Scarlet, used to play with this other cat, and they both kind of disappeared around the same time. And I'm thinking that my neighbor who, or, or a neighbor decided that the other cat needed a permanent playmate, and my poor cat got victimized. You think that your neighbor stole your cat? Yeah. I mean, I mean, not a neighbor I know, but someone in the neighborhood. Yeah. What about coyotes? supposedly all the coyotes were on the other side of town. So that's why I wasn't too worried. about. How do you coyote. know that the coyotes were on the other side of town? Because they were spotted. Um, hmm. I have neighbors or friends that live on that side of town. And they told me that a, a coyote was spotted and someone called animal control. And it was this whole big thing. You don't believe that cats should be kept inside and protected from the elements, the animals, uh, yes and no. This is the first time when I was a kid, I had a, um, an indoor, strictly indoor cat. And so this is the first time that I've had indoor outdoor cats. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of interesting because they bring home all types of, uh, animals, uh, for me to play with, uh, baby snakes and turtles and frogs and animals that I didn't even know was in my backyard. And they are, I guess, trying to prove their worth and letting me know how good of a job they're doing. Bringing you back presents. Yeah, to, that they're protecting the house. So Seems like a happier cat life to let them go outside. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think so. And I, and I feel like, um, you know, a lot of cats take <clears throat> to the outside uh, pretty naturally. Have cats been properly represented in cartoons? <laughs> accurately (laughs) yeah i think so i think so definitely um one of my favorite cartoon cats is uh salem from the original sabrina the teenage witch series uh that um showed up around 1969 and salem had all the looks and attributes of a regular cat but just imagine knowing how cats are that if a cat has an attitude with you, all of a sudden they can use magic and turn you into a frog. And uh, I thought that uh, Salem's depiction on the series was someone who was definitely a cat owner and thinking, wow, if my cat had super magical powers, things would get out of hand pretty fast and would grow exponentially. So uh, I always thought that that was like the perfect depiction of a cat, a cartoon cat, with powers, but still acting like a regular cat. Do you remember uh, Courageous Cat and Minute Mouse? Oh, yeah. I love that show. That was one of my favorite yeah. cartoons. Yeah, that series was created by uh, uh, Bob Kane, who actually created, you know, the original Batman and Robin series. Is that right? Yeah. No kidding. So, you know, he had a lot of, you know, issues, illegal issues with DC Comics over copyright and and ownership of the characters. And so he decided to go ahead and make this cartoon that would definitely and solely be his creation. And, uh, you know, if you look at Courageous Cat and Minute Mouse, it is Batman and Robin, except, you know, one is a a cat and one is a mouse. That's interesting. So that was in a response to his legal difficulties? Yes. With DC? Yes. To have something that is his own without any... uh, interference from the from the publisher 
Was that a popular cartoon? Yeah, it was a pretty popular cartoon. Um, it was syndicated <laughs> to independent stations, and uh, it ran for a pretty long time. So you're a cartoon expert. Yes. Your enthusiasm for cartoons, did it predate your employment here? Yes. Yeah, so uh, that's kind of a funny story, too. I was always a comic book fan first. And um, one summer, my parents sent me to day camp and I met this kid named Gerald. And this kid, Gerald, he was a comic book fan as well. But he was able to predict um, what the studios out in L.A. were going to be producing or what studios or what these studios uh, where they were going to go and get properties Um this kid at your day camp. At, at my day camp, right. Wow. And so, like, he predicted that one of the studios would go after Josie and the Pussycats, and um, he made some other predictions, too. I think he made the prediction about um, the studios going after Sabrina the Teenage Witch, and and he was the one that kind of told me who all the players were. And so he, I always considered him my Yoda. Were those all comics to begin with? They were all comics, And yes. he was a big fan, like you were, of those as comics. Right. So... Answering your question, yeah, I, I became a fan because of meeting this one person who was able to predict what the what what the studios in L.A. were going to do in terms of making new cartoons. Wow, some random kid in camp. Yeah, yeah, was onto that. Yeah, um, and then another interesting thing happened. Um, based on Gerald's prediction, I uh, bought like one of my first Josie and the Pussycats books. And uh, in that particular story, the characters were, well, it was kind of like a weird crossover. The characters went to California to meet the guys working on their cartoon series. So that was the first time I actually saw William Hanna and Joe Barbera. I actually saw what they looked like. Uh, it also, the story also included Joe Ruby and Ken Spears, who were the head writers for Josie and the Pussycats and the co-creators of Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? And um, there was also Iwu Takamato, who was the production designer. He showed up in the comic book panel. And years later, I ended up um, meeting Ken Spears, and he had no idea that he was depicted in this Josie comic. And so I scanned some of the panels and I sent it to him and he was really pleasantly surprised that he had showed up in this book in 1970 and <laughs> had no idea. Wow. How, how many years later was that? Um, I want to say if Josie came out in 1970, so like around 2005, 2006. Wow. Yeah, um, I was working on the Cartoon Network side of the business at the time, and we were trying to figure out when Scooby-Doo, Where Are You was originally pitched. And our senior VP at the time told me to, you know, send send some correspondence to Ken Spears and see if he can, you know, enlighten us. Um, the project ended up going away, but I continued to talk to Ken and ask him all kind of cool questions about what it was like to work in the industry at the time. And uh he was really nice and answered all of my questions. And then he joked with me and said, so when is the book coming out? And at the time, I had no intentions of writing a book at all. But I think it's kind of funny that he figured out that sooner or later I would write a book. Wow. A lot of ESP going on in your, <laughs> in your world. Yeah, it seems to be uh, a lot of connections happening. Your book, The Best Saturdays of Our Lives. Tell us about that. All right. So The Best Saturdays of Our Lives is a book that chronicles how Saturday morning programming became a competitive business and the proving ground uh, for what would become the 24-hour kids network. Cartoon network. Cartoon network. Yeah. Or, or, or yeah, or, any 24-hour any kids network business. You. Um, so the book uh, talks about all the programming trends from the 1960s all the way through the early digital imprint of the 1990 cartoons. To a young listener, explain what Saturday mornings might mean in the cartoon world. Yeah, absolutely. So Saturday morning was the only new destination that if you were a kid growing up, and this is before streaming, Cable television, satellites, DVRs and VCRs, 
Saturday morning was the only place where you can see new animated cartoons or new live action series on three networks. Now, if you lived in a bigger television market like New York, L.A. or um, Chicago, you probably had access to more cartoons that usually aired in the afternoon or in the morning. But anything that was brand spanking new showed up on Saturday morning between 8 a.m. and probably around 1 p.m. Again, depending on what market you were in. And so this was the absolute best destination to watch the 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 best cartoons and live action entertainment being made for kids for a very, very long time. So that's what Saturday morning was all about. So there weren't a whole lot of other entertainment choices for kids. And it was a ritual for people. Kids would get up in their pajamas and get their cereal and watch Saturday morning uh, TV because a lot of times parents didn't care about cartoons. And so Saturday morning was sort of our time or, or, or if, you know, if you were a kid during that era to watch cartoons. Your parents wouldn't bother you. They wouldn't try and take away the TV. They could sleep late. When I started working at Cartoon Network, I, I heard crazy stories about how someone had an older sister or, or an older brother and they controlled the TV and they could never watch what they wanted to watch. And they had to wait until something was released on DVD or when something was syndicated later to actually watch the show. And that's sad. The best Saturdays of our lives. How do people buy that book? All right. They can go to my website thebestsaturdaysofourlives.com. But if they don't feel like typing in thebestsaturdaysofourlives.com, they can just type in the initials, uh, tbsool.com, and they can order a signed copy from me. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. So you had a enthusiasm from your childhood. Yes. And then what? Then I uh, became a paper boy. Um, and, you know, my job to deliver the you know, the New York Daily News and the New York Times. And um, you're, I, from New, you're from New York. Yes. And from the Bronx, New York. And I um, discovered that there was a, a really cool TV section in way in the back, like after the sports section, it was this, this little TV section. And I started reading this TV uh, section and it revealed what shows would be renewed and which shows would get canceled. And um, I sort of became an expert in that area. And uh, by the time I got to middle school, they were calling me the walking TV guide. You know, I had become like this super nerdy um, TV guide uh, person that could predict whether your show would live or die. And um, like I had total strangers just coming up to me and asking me questions like, do you know if the six million dollar man is going to be renewed or not? <laughs> And of course, I had an answer for them. But then just reading the articles wasn't enough. I actually started to call the networks directly and would ask about just not the primetime stuff, but the Saturday morning cartoons. And they probably didn't get a lot of these calls. I don't think they did. I don't think they did because it was always a very nice person on the other line. Were they confused or were they happy to hear from you? Well, or? They seem to be pretty happy to hear from me because, and I'll tell you why, because it was always someone nice and very pleasant and patient because I would ask three questions, usually what shows are being renewed, what shows are being canceled. And of the new shows that they're bringing in, I wanted to know who was the production team behind the program. And they would just tell you. They would tell me. Huh. And you were a kid? I was a kid. Well, 12, 13. Yeah. Yeah. So that was an advantage of living in New York, too, because it was just a local call. Now there's whole industries built around this information. Right. <laughs> and you were just doing it on your own back then for your own enthusiasm. Yeah, yeah. In fact, my mom told me um, years ago that she thought that Hanna-Barbera was this woman that I just couldn't stop talking about. <laughs> and, you know, I had to... You know, explain to her oh, that no, it's two, yeah, it's right. It's two guys actually. They have a, a production company. The, oh, the, uh, the other thing that ha also happened was I also wrote my first um, fan letter to a studio around the same time. So um, the Shazam TV series uh, was one of my favorites, and um, 
I was inspired and I decided to send them a show idea, the studio show idea. So, you know, they sent me a, an autographed picture of the Shazam cast with a nice letter saying that they can't take unsolicited uh, show ideas, but thank me for sending it. And, and they're happy that I'm watching the series. For me, I was just happy to get something from that studio and to get a studio. You know, I still have the envelope. Uh, with the studio logo on it. And uh, years later at Comic-Con 2012, I ended up meeting the actor uh, who played uh, Billy Batson, an actor named Michael Gray, uh, played Billy Batson. And we spoke for about 15 minutes. We had a really great conversation. He was a super, super nice guy. And uh, I ended up <laughs> buying, getting an autograph from him. Um, and I usually don't, buy autographs at conventions, but something really embarrassing happened when I went to purchase my autograph. The autograph was $20 and I only had $8 in my wallet. And I said, you know, real quick, I can go to an ATM and get the rest of it. And he said, well, how much do you have? I said, $8. And he goes, I'll take it. He says, me and my wife are getting ready to leave anyway, so it's fine. You know, and I'm like, oh, I said, okay, cool. So that was pretty nice of him as well. But but, but you know, you ever see a cartoon where someone looks in their wallet and kind of like dust? Yeah, moth well, fly out. Yeah, moth fly out. That's how I felt <laughs> when I opened my wallet and and I didn't have enough money to pay Michael Gray. Oh, he took your eight bucks, so. Yeah, he did take it. <laughs> so it all worked out. So you parlay your enthusiasm for cartoons. Right. And how do you turn that into a job? Okay, so a couple of things happened. Um, went to school for radio and television communications. I went to New York Institute of Technology, graduated, got a job working in television, and really didn't like a lot of the, the jobs or positions that I had, nor did I like the pay. But I leave. I get a regular job that's paying double the amount that the TV job was paying but there was no creative outlet. And realizing my mistake, I wanted to get back into television, but I wanted to get back into television under my own terms and, you know, be able to work with in cartoons or, or um, comics or some, something that I actually liked and, and was my original inspiration. And so I decided to launch the Best Saturdays of Our Lives newsletter. And I sent that newsletter out to everyone and anyone who touched kids' content at the time. And it, you know, went to Cartoon Network, Disney, Nickelodeon, DC Comics, Marvel Comics, because during those during that time in the early nineties, Marvel was still Marvel and DC was still marketing to um a kid's audience. And after a while the newsletter started to take off. Um DC Comics called me and wanted me to participate in an online trivia show. And then uh, Sid and Marty Croft called. Uh, there was an executive there named Joe King, who uh, was like their um, executive in charge of production. And he called to find out who I was. And and one of the things that got Sid and Marty Croft was that I was one of the few people that got their episode count of H.R. Puffin stuff correct. So they were just very impressed by that. What do you mean? There was confusion? Yeah. <laughs> because the series ran on NBC for many years and then it switched networks. And I think I, no new episodes were ever ordered after it switched networks. And I think that um, there was a lot of confusion as to how many episodes they act that were actually produced. And after a while, Joe King took me under his wing and started to teach me the TV business and, you know, show, teach me how television syndication works and who's cool in the industry and who isn't cool in the industry. And things like if no one calls you back, that means that they're no longer interested in, in your pitch or your show. And uh, they actually used a copy of my original newsletter to pitch to the syndicators um, because they felt that my original newsletter of H.R. Puff and stuff captured what the show was about. And so they used that as an example, as a pitch to hopefully create a, a new H.R. Puff and stuff series. It didn't go anywhere, but, um, but Joe and I, we, uh, you know, stayed friends for a long time. And during my last appearance at, uh, um, not appearance, but the last time I went to Comic-Con, uh, Sid and Marty Croft were, were there and I went up and I introduced myself to them and, you know, I want, and I, and I, and I did ask about Joe King 
And uh, Sid told me that Joe had unfortunately passed away the year before because it just would have been really nice to, uh, you know, personally thank the guy for taking me under his wing yeah. and, and uh, helping me out when, you know, he was a Hollywood guy and he definitely didn't have to do it. But it something about me he liked and he took the time to try to teach me some things. So then in 1996, Cartoon Network called. They called you based on the newsletter. Correct. And um, there was a project called This Week in Tunes. And um, Mike Lazo was looking for a companion show for Space Ghost Coast to Coast. And the premise of the show, This Week in Tunes, was sort of based on the Georgia gang or... The Sunday political talk shows where you have your Democratic strategist and your Republican strategist and everyone's having different opinions, except we were talking about cartoons we liked and which ones we didn't like and why and offering our opinions about why we would like the Chuck Jones Daffy Duck um, compared to a Bob Clampett Daffy Duck version. Well, let's hear your opinions. <laughs> Oh, that was just an example. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> so were you to host that? Were you to no, build no. it? No, I was, I was uh, one of the panelists. Uh, Seth MacFarlane was actually the host. No so kidding. it was Seth MacFarlane, uh, Linda Semensky, and me. And there was a kid that he had won a Cartoon Network contest, and he was allowed to program the entire Cartoon Network day, and they brought him in as a guest as well. And this kid was really funny because he knew Linda and I guess he knew Seth MacFarlane as well, but he didn't know me. And he immediately, you know, was trying to test me to see if I was worthy <laughs> of being one of the panelists. Wow. And I thought it was pretty funny. Tables have turned on oh, you. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, his mom was like really super nice. Um, uh, but the pilot didn't go anywhere. And um, I later, you know, did ask for a job, see if there were any job openings at Cartoon Network, but um, there were none. And so I took the initiative and just moved down to Georgia, you know, and hoping uh, that you I would land something. Figure it out. Right. Exactly. Wow. And um, I kept in contact with some of the people I met on that on that pilot uh, shoot and Seth MacFarlane? Uh, not, unfortunately, <laughs> it's funny you mentioned Seth MacFarlane because I found an old, I, I found an old phone book with Seth's information. You know, we did exchange information, but we never stayed in contact. And so the joke that I always share with people, I'm like, wow, sometimes I wonder how different my career career would have been if I had stayed friends with Seth MacFarlane. You know, you know, there's no guarantees, but uh, it's just something sure. I think about sometimes. Yeah. But uh, I stayed in contact with Linda Semensky, and uh, there was a producer also on the series um, whose name escapes me right now. But I, I kept in contact with them, and they told me about um, an open position in the library to be the Cartoon Network librarian. And so I sent my resume in, and they called me in for an interview. You had your hands on yeah, and everything I, at... What was it? Hanna Barbera Library, Hanna Barbera Library, the Warner Brothers Library, the MGM Library for domestic as well as international. So Cartoon Network Latin America, they were also my clients. Chris Kelly, for example, that's how Chris and I met. Uh, he was working for Cartoon Network on air, and Chris was very specific about <laughs> what he wanted. Like uh, I think one time he had to do Super Friends promotions, and he told me straight up, "Do not send me anything from season one because nothing happens except for a lot of talking, and you can send me anything after season one." You know, which I thought was kind of funny. You guys really have had your own language mm -hmm. yeah. about cartoons. Yeah, exactly. How do you how do you grow from your job as Cartoon Network librarian? to come into Adult Swim. Okay, so there was a little bit of an in-between. So I left the library. So um, Mike Lasso hired me uh, to be part of the team that helped launch the Boomerang Network. And so for years, I was a programmer at Cartoon Network and Boomerang and, you know, uh, helped with the series launches for the original Samurai Jack, the Justice League series, um, came up with stunt ideas for the Powerpuff Girls, um, 
you know, like we might do something like uh, the 10 best Powerpuff Girl episodes or, you know, maybe it's Dexter's Lab, Mad Scientist uh, stunt or something like that. And um, for a while, you know, that was pretty cool doing all that stuff. And I... A lot of great original programming coming out of the network. Right. You were involved with. And I'll be honest with you, um, I didn't think that... As much as I love classic cartoons and programming those cartoons and stunting the Cartoon Network originals like the Powerpuff Girls and Ed, Ed, and Eddie and Courage the, the Cowardly Dog, programming the promos and pack packaging strategy has been my dream job. But it's, I didn't know it was my dream job. You didn't know it was a job? You didn't know that you'd love it? I didn't know I would love it. I knew it was a job. Yeah. I didn't know I would love it because I had a lot of uh, interaction with the team that programmed promos and, sh and packaging on the cartoon side. And, you know, they seemed to be happy in their jobs, but I didn't know how much I would love this job. And what's really nice is that after all the, the shows have been timed out and all the commercials have been put in, I get the schedule and I figure out the best promo story to tell for each evening every night every night every night on adult swim correct you tell a story correct via the promos correct yes give an example of of a story that you would tell through the course of the night in promos that's interesting that you that you describe it as such all right so um a good example might be something like saturday night where you know we have a lot of tanami uh our tanami block our tanami anime block and so you have your Dragon Ball Super promo, your um, The Promised Neverland promo, a Sword Art Online promo. And, you know, they all air right behind each other. And you, you, those are probably the only promos I am airing leading up to the block. And then once I get to the Tanami block, um, I start airing maybe a game review or a music video. And then the story shifts to next week on Dragon Ball Super or next week on The Promised Neverland. And so um, the viewers are getting to see, like, here's what's happening tonight. Here's what we have that special in between once the block starts. And here's what you can check out next week. And here's what you can check out tomorrow on Sunday night, some of our premieres. And so it's usually a mixture of those shows. Sometimes I don't air like like uh, Your Pretty Face that usually has Friday night premieres. I may sprinkle some of those promos in there. But like next Friday is so far away. I feel like the priority should be whatever's happening that night. Here's what's happening special on Saturday, here's what's happening special for next Saturday, and here's what's happening special tomorrow. And that, that pretty much tells a, a, a good story. Top five favorite cartoons. All right. Give me five. Okay, I can. Uh, first, right off the top of the list, I have to say it's Josie and the Pussycats. And the reason I choose that show was because when I was a kid, I thought it was, I, it didn't make sense to me that any animation studio would want to turn Josie and the Pussycats into a cartoon. First of all, the comic book wasn't that great of a seller. It was primarily aimed at girls and I didn't see anything special about it. But what shocked me as a kid was that the direction that Hanna-Barbera took the series in was brilliant. Uh, they didn't stick to the comic book formula at all. They became the wrong kids in the wrong place who rise through the occasion to save the world. And Hanna-Barbera, or I should say Joe Ruby and Ken, Smith, Ken Spears, smartly brought in supervillains for Josie and her friends to battle. And supervillains like you know Captain Nemo uh, from the 20,000 Leagues under the sea novel and uh, the invisible man, you know, from the universal monster movies and some James Bond knockoffs were in there as well. And uh, I thought that was brilliant too, because that ensured that boys as well as girls would watch Josie and the Pussycats. They gave it an edge. And they also, um, there was some really good 
scoring for the series. Um, Ted Nichols, who I interview in my book, uh, was Hanna-Barbera's musical director for 10 years. And he created some really great music scoring for the series. But the music supervisor working on that show brought back a lot of Ted Nichols' greatest scores from Johnny Quest and from the Herculoids and from the Arabian Nights. And uh, it, it gave Josie a much greater edge as opposed to Scooby-Doo, the arch he's supposed to bring to the Teenage Witch. And I thought it was a very smart and brilliant way for Hanna-Barbera to go because Hanna-Barbera probably did not want to do what was already being done with the Archies and with Sabrina the Teenage Witch since Josie was from the same comic book home. So being that they were the leaders at the time in the industry, they had to go in a completely different direction. And I just take my hat off to that creative team because I thought that they really pulled off a really, a really brilliant show. All right. Let's see. That's an incredibly thoughtful answer. <laughs> I hadn't you. thought of any of that stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle uh, would be my second choice. This series came out in 1976 by Filmation. And they, they utilized a lot of rotoscoped technologies where they, you know, they film an actor being athletic, swinging, jumping, swimming, and um, and then they trace over the live action and turn it into animation. And Tarzan was the best looking Saturday morning series on the air in 1976. And um, he was very realistic moving, I mean, looking as well as moving. The cartoon series had wonderful backgrounds and they had good writers and... The animated series was very close to the original source material. And um, it was just a really good looking show. And to tell you how much this show really changed the industry, because after Tarzan premiered, a lot of the other studios also started rotoscoping their characters as well to give those uh, characters a more realistic look. But the funniest thing that happened during this era was that Joe Ruby and Ken Spears came out with a plastic man a comedy series and it had it was very similar uh, to another series called Tarzan and the Super 7 that you know there was like a lot of other characters in the show and at the end of the Plastic Man open Plastic Man says hey ta- hey ape man eat your heart out and it was a direct response of one studio calling out another studio or Plastic Man calling out Tarzan. And I always thought it was cool that Joe Ruby and Ken Spears decided to put that in the open because that was their way of saying, yeah, you you, you guys made a pretty good show, but our show is definitely much better. But, you know, it just kind of tells me what type of uh, um, sh- response and shakeup that that series put on the map. And... Um, I just thought that Filmation did a really good job with Tarzan, Lord of, Lord of the Jungle. Brave Star, which is a syndicated television series that features the first Native American superhero with his own show. It takes place um, in the future, and he has Strength of the Bear, uh, Speed of the Puma, Eyes of the Hawk, and um, Ears of the Wolf. Uh, they used a lot of Native American actors and directors on the series and content wise they really really pushed the envelope uh there was a really good uh drug or drug abuse episode and not to give away what happens at the end but things don't go too well for one of the characters at the end and i think if this show had run on saturday morning and not been syndicated they probably wouldn't have gotten away with what they what they got away with but the 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 episode the Brave Star episode was actually produced during the crack epidemic in the U.S. and um, I think the producers wanted to respond to that and so they created an episode where there was a future version of crack. It was called Spin, and uh, there were all these spinheads as opposed to crackheads in the episode, and uh, it was pretty pretty interesting um, episode. Um, Seth Green one time who's, you know, behind Robot Chicken, the creator of Robot Chicken, was visiting the Cartoon Network offices one day. And he got here early and I was here early. And he just comes into my office and he's pointing at this action figure. And I'm like, can I help you? (laughs) And he goes, who is that? And I said, oh, that's Brave Star. And he goes, oh, yeah, the Space Cowboy. I said, I remember that show. 
And then um, I tell him I'm a big fan of Robot Chicken and he goes, yeah, we're going to be around here the whole day. And of course, I don't see him, but I thought it was really cool that he he came in and he spotted the Brave Star action figure. So I'm, so obviously, he must have been watching that series as well, even though <laughs> it's probably not a popular choice right now. I have to go with um, Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids. Wow. Yeah. And um, I really like the show. Um I thought it was very funny and innovative and had good music and good lessons. And, you know, uh, there were things as a kid that I definitely could relate to because Fat Albert and his friends, sometimes they were bored and sometimes they played games. And they, the Fat Albert crew reminded me of me and my friends growing up in the Bronx. Um, and that was the first time I saw something like that depicted on television. So I absolutely could relate to it. And um, a funny thing about Fat Albert, it did really well ratings wise because CBS kept it out of traffic. It aired like at 1230 or one o'clock in the afternoon. Years later, NBC ended up acquiring it and they put it at 10 a.m. in the morning and the series got killed by the competition. So it was one of those shows that I think it did really well and it did really good because it aired later and because it had educational um, content. That's probably why it aired later in the day. One more. One more. Hmm. The whole canon of okay entertainment. Okay. What right. can it be? The Archie Comedy Hour featuring Sabrina the Teenage Witch. That was also a really great show because that was my first introduction to the character of Sabrina the Teenage Witch. And from what I understand, that show did really, really good ratings. And uh, Filmation stuck to the original source material. So in this version of Sabrina, she is forced to do bad things. And if she doesn't do bad things, um, bad things might happen to her and her family. But I think the craziest episode that really got me on board with the series was that she didn't want to study her witchcraft book and she was complaining. And then the head witch, Della, shows up and Della decides to take Sabrina out of the home because one of the witches, Aunt Zelda, is quote unquote too human to show Sabrina how to be a proper witch. And next thing you know, this other witch shows up that looks like the traditional witch. She's she's haggard over and looks terrible. And when Sabrina says that she wants to stay and that she loves her aunt, the new witch says, love? Oh, I got my work cut out for me. We got to get you out of here. And so that episode just kind of, in a very subversive way, showed what Sabrina and her family were all about. And it, the episode actually disturbed me as a kid. Dark. Yeah, it was very dark. And it disturbed me as a kid as well because I'm like, oh my gosh, someone can just show up and just take you out of the home? Obviously, at that time, I hadn't heard of defects, but <laughs> I just thought it was kind of scary. And But of course, everything worked out in the end, but the show had a little bit of an edge and that's why I liked, and um, I just thought that it that they did a great job depicting this this character that is kind of part of an evil legacy, but she has to work her way through that legacy to make things work out for herself. So I became a fan. And they. Uh... A sign of things to come. Dark cartoons in your future. Right. <laughs> they, they'd only get darker. Wow. Exactly. Exactly. So I guess uh, it was meant to be. I'm at Adult Swim. <laughs> meant to be. Mark McRae. Thanks for coming on. Uh, thanks for having me on the uh, Adult Swim podcast. It's been a blast. Music from this episode is a song called Living in America from the album Sun Bronze Greek Gods by Dom. Be sure to visit adultswim.com slash podcast for links to some of the things Mark and I were just talking about. And as always, we'd love to hear from you, adultswimpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.